Hi everybody, my name is Sean Thompson and today I'm going to take you through my 10 step method for interpreting a 12 lead ECG. Now it's incredibly important that we have a good systematic method for interpreting ECGs. When you're first presented with an ECG it can be very easy and tempting just to purely look at the irregularities that are staring you right in the face. So perhaps that's something like ST elevation or some form of very, very obvious arrhythmia. But often when we do that, we may actually miss some really, really vital information. So as well as seeing those very, very obvious and potentially life-threatening um, changes on the ECG, it's important also to look for the subtle changes that we may miss on first glance. Now the first thing I look at in my 10 step method is the rate. How many beats per minute? Now let's have a look at an ECG to see an example of this. Now let's have a look at this ECG here. Now there are lots of different methods for determining the rate. Clearly you can see the rate that's given to you in the interpretation, in this case 72 beats per minute. But another really useful way of doing this for a regular rhythm is the 300 step method. Okay, all you need to do is take one of the complexes, in my case I usually take the R wave and I count the, um, the distance in large squares from um, one R wave to the next R wave. Okay, and I go 300, 150, 100, 75. And in this case it's around about the 75 um, beat per minute um, uh, region. Now the next thing I look at is the regularity. So is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it irregularly irregular as in the case of a rhythm such as atrial fibrillation? And if we look at this rhythm it's nice and regular and a really good way to work this out is simply just to fold the ECG over on itself Hold it up to the light and see if the, um, the QRS complexes line up nice and regularly. Okay, now um, with a situation, say for example a, a, a young teenager um, who are particularly susceptible to, um, to irregularities, sinus arrhythmias relating to inspiration and expiration, now that is a normal change, okay, but it still is a sinus arrhythmia. But see these things in the context of the patient that you are assessing at the time to determine is this normal or is this normal for them? The next thing I look at is the P wave. Okay? For it to be a sinus rhythm, it's got to have a P wave. Okay? P wave indicates that the SA node is firing. Now, is the P wave present? Is it absent? And what are the characteristics of it? Now, normally the P wave should be a positive deflection above the level of the isoelectric line. There should be a P wave present before every single QRS complex to let you know that every QRS complex is a sinus complex, so it originates in the sinoatrial node. Okay, the next thing we look at is the PR interval, and that is the distance from the start of the P wave to the start of the Q wave or the start of the QRS complex. Now, if that PR interval starts to get elongated above five small squares, which is 0.24 uh, seconds, then we start getting to the realms of a first degree heart block. And we're not going to talk about the other heart blocks at this stage, but needless to say, just look at the PR interval. Is it um, within normal limits? Is it less than sort of the 0.2 to 0.24 second range? Or is it getting longer than that? The third, the, sorry, the fifth thing I look at is a QRS complex. Now we can gather a huge amount of information by looking at our QRS complex. What is the duration of our QRS complex? Now to determine the, the duration we go from the start of the Q wave or if there's no negative deflection first of all then the start of the R wave, so that's the upward wave, to the J point. The J point is that section right at the end of the QRS complex. Now for it to be a normal duration of QRS complex it needs to be less than 0.12 seconds. Okay, so that's less than or equal to three small squares. Any longer than that, then you're starting to get some kind of a conduction defect as you're um, in, in the depolarization of the ventricles. Q waves, are there Q waves present? So the Q wave, remember, is that first negative deflection following the P wave. 
Okay, it's normal to get the odd little tiny Q wave, but when they start to get deep, especially if they're deeper than say 25% the height of the R wave and greater than one square wide, then that can be a sign of damage. So check to see if there are those, those large prominent Q waves, often called pathological Q waves. What about things like precordial concordance? So across those chest leads, V1 to V6, are they all positive above the isoelectric line or predominantly all negative below the isoelectric line? Is the good R wave progression? So is the R wave progressing and changing in a, in a fluid motion or are there sort of jumps and, and differences in the R wave progression across those um, precordial leads, V1 to V6? Is there a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block? Is there hypertrophy present, whether it be left ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, um, perhaps there's some right atrial, left atrial enlargement that you're able to see from this ECG, a little bit trickier, but certainly those, um, those ventricular hypertrophies are important to look at. And a good way of determining that is looking at the height of the QRS complex, especially either an AVL or um, the precordial leads, V1 through to V6. So go away and look at your textbooks or go and look at some online resources to work out exactly um, what the criteria are to determine if this ECG fits the criteria for hypertrophy. So that's chamber enlargement. So axis. Is this a normal axis? Is it a left axis deviation? Is it a right axis deviation? Or is there extreme axis deviation? Right, ST segment. Now let's look at our ST segment. That's the, the period from the J point, or the end of the QRS complex, to the T wave. Okay, we're looking at things like, is it, um, is it ST elevation, which is a really important one to look for. And we see ST elevation here in this ECG, and a little bit in lead V1, but certainly in V2 and in V3 is the ST depression. ST depression typically is an ischemic change, but it could also be a reciprocal change. Okay, so you might have um, an ST elevation or an infarction in one, one portion of the heart, but the reciprocal side, the lead that's looking at the opposite side, will have a mirror image, which is ST um, depression. So it might have elevation one side, depression the other side. Depression down here, elevation up here. So you're thinking about the reciprocal image. Okay? Um, what about bundle branch blocks? What about discordance and concordance? Now let's look at the T wave. Okay? A normal T wave should be slightly asymmetrical, so slightly skewed off to one side. Now, is the T wave super peaky? Okay, really high and really peaked. And if it is, that can be a sign of an electrolyte imbalance, such as hyperkalemia. All right. Um, and then finally, your interpretation. Okay. So, very important to say whether or not it's a sinus rhythm. If it's got a P wave that initiates a curious complex, then it's a sinus rhythm. Okay. Is it tachycardia, bradycardia, or regular? Okay. Now, if if it's a regular sinus rhythm, say sinus rhythm. Is there an MI? Okay. Is there an infarction? Is there a heart block? Is there a bundle branch block? So what is your interpretation? Now with this one, I'm going to say quite confidently that that's a sinus rhythm because it's got a P wave before every curious complex. There's not a, a, a big um, PR interval. It's, it's, it's within normal limits there from what I can tell. Okay, so it's a sinus rhythm, it's not super fast, it's not super slow. So it's a sinus rhythm with what actually looks to be here, um, elevation through V2 and V3 certainly, and, and a little bit of elevation in V1. So those are my septal and anterior leads. So V1 is always septal, V2 is either septal or anterior, V3 is always anterior. Okay, so I'm saying it's a sinus rhythm with an acute, because it's happening right now, sinus rhythm with an acute anteroseptal myocardial infarction. Okay, that's my interpretation. That's what I'm going to write down. That's what I'm going to hand over to my cardiologist. What about coronary arteries? Now, coronary arteries are incredibly important, okay? And there are three coronary arteries that I care about, and those are the left anterior descending, the left circumflex, and the right coronary artery. 
So let's take a look at these. A really great way to work this out is by using the octopus model. Okay, so what I do to visualize this, because I'm a visual kind of person, is I, is I imagine the aorta just sort of sitting over AVR, and it's not, but just for argument's sake. And then the right coronary artery, that comes off there, and that right coronary artery, that perfuses the regions of the heart that are afflicted in lead 2, 3, and AVF. Okay, so those are your inferior leads. And if we look at, at this image here, we can see that 2, 3, and AVF are your inferior leads. Okay, so they are perfused by the right coronary artery. The next one I look at is the left anterior descending artery. And the left anterior descending artery it perfuses the septal regions, but also the anterior regions. Okay, so it leads V1, V2, V3, and V4. Okay, and if we look here, we can see V1, V2, V3, and V4, they are perfused by the LAD, the left anterior descending artery. Now, then we've got the left circumflex, and it's important to note that both the LAD and the left circumflex both come off the left main artery. Okay, there's a bifurcation really high up, and it splits off into these two um, large arteries. So the left circumflex, that, um, that perfuses the, um, the lateral regions of the heart. So both your low lateral regions there in V5 and V6, but also your high lateral regions up in lead 1 and AVL. Okay, so here we see V5, V6, 1 and AVL, they are um, the lateral regions, and they are perfused by the left circumflex coronary artery. Now, if you've got a really, really high occlusion, way up high in the, the left main artery, even above the bifurcation, you can have a really significant um, infarction, uh, an extensive um, anterolateral myocardial infarction. And you might see all of those regions there from V1 through V6 and even up uh, lead 1 and AVL, they're all showing um, signs of infarction. That's pretty serious, that's a big infarction. Okay, so that is about it for my 10-step method. I hope this has been helpful for you, and we'll see you again next time.